So we are in my favorite part of the farm right now, which is in the high tunnel right next to our pickling cucumbers and our paste tomatoes, which are growing flawlessly right now. Best crop I've ever had. And everything's going right in between me here. Um, but this video is actually about everything going wrong. I want to talk about what's not going right on the farm because I think a lot of the internet, myself included, uh, anybody talking about farming, there's a lot of romance out there, a lot of highlight reels, the Instagram versus reality thing. And I want to talk about the reality part today, the really painful stuff, because I think there's still a lot of value to be learned in failure. You know, in school, we're taught that if you get a D or an F on a test, that, that's bad, that failure is bad. And I think it's not bad at all. I think it's extremely positive because if you look back, at least I'm, I'm just going to speak for myself, but if, you, if I look back at the failures, at least with just this farm or even pretty much the rest of my life, my entire life, it's molded me into the person that I am today. I am grateful for that failure right now because I have a perspective that I never would have had if everything came easy to me. I never would have had been able to appreciate the wins that we're having right now if I hadn't gone through all the blood, sweat, and tears over the last couple of years. And so what I'm going to do today is walk around and show you a couple of the really big failures that I have had this year. Um, and I can't really talk about all the failures of the farm in one video, but there's a couple of really big ones going on right now. This week has actually been filled with failures for me um, because a whole bunch of crops aren't ready yet and we have lots of demand right now. For instance, we have a veggie box today and we have 55 people to feed and we're very short on almost everything. I had to just scrounge, take little bits of crops from all sorts of other places to fit that 55 person payload that we have to put together this afternoon. And we've got it done, but it's, it's been real hard. And uh, I'll go into that later, but I'm going to show you some farm failures just to give you a little bit of a uh, taste of what reality is because every farm has failures like this and sort of how I deal with it. Um, you know, full disclosure, when I have failures, I am not a Buddhist monk at all. I still have temper tantrums. I get really pissed off, frustrated, but... I always am able to look back on them, especially now, like a couple years ago, looking at the failures that I had. I so appreciate the value um, now that I didn't understand at the time. And um, I'm going to go into that a little bit more as we go and show you some farm failures. And hopefully some of you out there find some value in this. If you do, please like this video and subscribe and share it with somebody that might need to hear it because I think... If we talk about failure a lot more openly in this day and age, um, it'll be a lot more socially acceptable and celebrated as a positive thing. And uh, like I said, I definitely don't always see it as a positive thing. I get demoralized all the time. This week I was very frustrated and demoralized. I'm still very human with this. But even these failures I'm about to talk about are, are teaching me something that I'll appreciate three years down the line, four years down the line. And... I'll be able to relate to people that have gone through similar failures, other business owners that I would never be able to relate to otherwise. So let's get into it and let's show you some failures. <sighs> okay, so I hope you can see this clearly. Um, it's kind of hard to see on the camera, but what we have going on right here is a bed of beets that I planted uh, about a month ago or something into a bed of soil that is right up against the edge of our high tunnel here and what happened is when I first built this tunnel we didn't till the entire footprint there was a little strip of grass that didn't get tilled real well and so it continued to grow and that was almost four years ago at this point and I've been ripping it out over and over again every time it kind of creeps in like this. And this is 
the fourth year that I've had this problem and it's the worst I've ever seen. And I basically at this point I'm going to, I'll have probably be able to harvest these beets. They're still pretty confident they're going to grow into beets. But after that, I'm going to have to put a black tarp over this bed and possibly this bed and keep it covered for at least a year to kill this grass. That's a big, big loss in potential revenue as a business. You know, it's not the end of the world. It's especially since I'm probably, I'm going to be building a new greenhouse next year. It's really not the end of the world, but it sucks because this is greenhouse space is like Manhattan real estate on a farm. You know, it's so valuable. It's, you know, the, it's way more valuable than stuff outside because I could get two or three crops in every footprint of this greenhouse. So there's all sorts of problems here. We got thistle growing here. Thistle cannot be pulled out by hand unless you pull it out over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for like every week for a year and then it might die. Um, Cause th these are all weeds that are growing really deep underground and coming up. You can't just pull them out one, one at a time. And that's what this grass is the same thing. And then we also got some bindweed in here to, to add to the mix and bindweed is the worst weed I have on the farm. It is, so hard to get rid of. Uh, I've never even gotten rid of it. And if you look up how to get rid of bindweed on the internet, you will find all sorts of fun little forums of people trying to figure out how to get rid of it. And a lot of them will just say move because it is never going away because these tendrils grow underground. They can grow under 30 feet. And um, so you can pull it up, pull it out, but it'll grow 30 feet over there. Really, really rough weed. Luckily, um, there's only a few spaces on the farm where it's really there. So it's not like it drops seed and it goes everywhere. That's the bright side with most of these weeds. So there's really not a whole lot of places where it's terrible, but it is a problem and I need to solve it. I, it well, if anybody has a solution to bindweed that's organic, I would be very interested. And I've read about spraying it with herbicide, which I'm strongly against spraying herbicide but it is the one that I halfway consider spraying because it is so bad. But um, I've heard that that doesn't even really work anyway. You still have the same problem. So it's something that I'm pretty confident black plastic for a year will solve the problem, but that means no crops in here for a full 365 days. So this is a big problem. And a, it, a, most of it is caused by my lack of experience, not knowing what I'm doing because this, Basically, this problem started when I first built the greenhouse. Now that I have had this problem, whenever I build another greenhouse, I'm going to put black plastic on the ground for a year beforehand to kill everything. That's what we're doing with the greenhouse right next to me. So the solution is that, and I've learned this is going to teach me a very hard lesson to never let this happen again. And if I ever help somebody else start a farm, I will tell them, and hopefully I'll show them this video, um, here's what not to do. So there's a lot of value in this failure. Like I said, I am, sh I am enduring the pain of this for the next year. Uh, probably a little more than that now, cause I'm probably not going to put the plastic on until the winter of this year or something. Um, or maybe even spring. It doesn't really matter, but, uh, I will be able to teach people how to avoid this problem. And that's the best solution is to avoid it in the first place. Um, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm a bad farmer or anything, right? You know, when you start any project, you're never going to be good at it. You know, I sucked at everything with this farm when I started. Um, and uh, so, like, in school, this would be marked as a D or an F on a test, right? But I don't see it that way. And it, it's... I see it as a learning experience and I'm going to be able to share this experience with you guys and any other farmer that I talk to in the next decade. I am going to have this experience burnt into my memory because I have felt the pain. And if you ever tried to pull thistle out by hand, you will feel the pain. It is not a good idea. Um, I'm not even going to bother pulling this thistle. It's not worth it. All I'm going to do is pull the beets out in a couple weeks and then I'll weed whack everything so it lays flat and then we'll put the plastic down I'll take this drip tape off 
and we will cover it for a year and that's the easiest way to solve it and it's expensive uh, as a business this is a pretty expensive problem but we should be able to make it so this never happens again you know i uh i've dug out this grass five times i've took a broad fork i've grabbed the grass tried to rip out every last little bit of it doesn't matter it's coming in from over there and i've already put black plastic on the perimeter so what i'll have to do is really get this stuff killed and put the plastic underneath this baseboard and there's a whole bunch of other ways to prevent this you know you could put you can bury some insulation two feet underground so you got a little perimeter so the grass can't grow in from underneath but most of this is because we didn't till it right the first time and that's that's fine i've learned my lesson now so this is the first problem so let's go on to the next one Okay, so right here we have some evidence of a tomato disease that we've had for the last two seasons that uh, I basically had to pull the plants. So what I did was I pulled the plants and I replanted with celery that I'm pretty sure is going to mature um, by October or something. Uh, just because I know the timing of it. And um, so we'll still make some money from growing this celery then. Um, but this tomato problem has been a very big soul crushing problem. Um, it's a bacterial disease of some kind. I think it's called bacterial canker. I've got a lab test this year to get it figured out. So I at least know what it is, but it's a soil borne disease that basically stops the plant from circulating nutrition and water and all sorts of stuff and it basically just starts to wilt from the growth tip and then dies <clears throat> and the only way to stop it from spreading is to pull the plant so i've probably pulled 20 or 30 plants in here this year and that's a lot of potential revenue uh luckily i'm not really too worried about it this because these tomatoes are kind of just to last us for the very end of the season and my first crop's doing really well so i think we'll be okay and everything behind me is looking great um uh, i'll show you that when we're done here um the tomatoes in here everyone that's living is looking really good and we'll just keep harvesting what we can and just be grateful for what we got but this disease is a real problem because it lasts in the soil for at least a year so supposedly i shouldn't grow tomatoes in here next year We'll see what I'm actually going to do. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm doing, if it doesn't get worse than this, I might still try it because it's really still worth growing them. I still have enough plants to where it's worth it. But uh, and the late season tomatoes are less important to me um, than the early seasons. But it's a, it's a soul crushing problem because these plants, there is so much stress and effort put into them to get them to grow as tall as this. There's, I have employees pruning them every single week. I planted them back in March. I start, I seeded them back in March. They've been grafted, which means there's two plants that you fuse into one. That's an extremely stressful process. Um, the seeds are a dollar a piece, or actually each plant is probably about three dollars in seed because there's two seeds that you have to buy. You have to buy the rootstock and the regular seed. So it's a big, you know, it's, it sucks. It's, um, you know, I, I am a little bit better prepared for it this year because I kind of knew it was there. Uh, I had a feeling this would happen again and I wanted to try anyway because it's the only way to know. And I think it was the right decision because we're going to get plenty of tomatoes out of here, but um, it hurts bad um, when you have that much effort and money involved in it, uh, not to mention the money lost from the crop you know that's not growing it's it's a soul crushing problem you know last year when this happened i literally just fell to my knees because it was really bad last year it was like 25 30 percent of the plants were dying and none of them produced well but there was something else going on too there was herbicide drift going on but luckily we didn't have that this year so it's much better so i have that perspective of last year was 10 times was five times worse than this. So I'm grateful that it looks as good as it does. And that's one of those things, you know, last year was so much worse that I have the perspective that I'm grateful for what I have now because I've seen worse. 
And that's one of those things that I didn't understand last year at the time, but it's given me the perspective of I'm grateful for these tomatoes, so grateful because I've seen how bad it can be. And tomatoes on a farm like mine are the most important crop to have because not only do they make really, really good money, they make other things sell really well. They're the, pretty much like the filet mignon of the vegetable farm, right? Everybody comes to your booth for tomatoes, especially in my climate. Nobody has tomatoes around here because it's cold. I am probably going to be the only one, virtually the only one with tomatoes at the market I'm selling at for the rest of the season because it's just so cold. We're li living in the mountains in Cody, Wyoming, and I sell in Billings, Montana, but it's the same thing. There's no tomatoes there because it's cold. You know, Illinois and the Midwest are less valuable, but for here, if you have a greenhouse like this, it's extremely valuable crop. So I'm so grateful for these tomatoes. I mean, I literally say thank you to the plants every time I pick them. And the plants in the other greenhouse are doing really well, but they're, they're getting old and they're not going to last too much longer. So I'm just, I'm so grateful for the sea of green that I'm looking at right now. Because even with this problem, there is still some, this is like, I'm seeing it, I'm trying to see the glass half full. And, you know, I make it sound easy and it's not. I still have the temper tantrums. Um, you know, it still frustrates me every time I pull a plant. You know, I've been pulling about five to six plants a week for the past six weeks. And that's, you know, it's painful, man, um, to see something you put that much effort in fail. But it's, uh, it's taught me a lot. You know, I don't want to bank on tomatoes being my number one moneymaker from now on. You know, what I look at is I want to grow just enough. I don't want to grow like enough to sell cases of tomatoes. I want to grow enough just to draw people in and still make good money on what I've got. Because at the end of the day, like they're really profitable crop, but this kind of crop is almost as profitable if you flip it over just as en enough. But I won't sell as much of this if I don't have this. You see what I mean? So it's a good, it's been a really good learning experience to just, this is the sexy crop. But I need to appreciate, I still, I just, I appreciate it, but I still need to grow the less sexy crops just as much because these make just as much money if you know what you're doing. And it's uh, probably one of the toughest lessons I've learned is, is this tomato problem. I, I wouldn't say the toughest, but it's one of the really painful ones because it's just, there's a lot of emotion and stress tied up in this. I I actually like to have my employees work on these more than me because I get stressed out just looking at them because I'm pretty experienced at noticing little problems and I could tell there's something wrong and they don't know that yet. But like it's uh, it's hard for me to be relaxed in here sometimes when things aren't going well. And uh, another thing that this teaches me and, and anyone is just how to be calm when things aren't going wrong, right. And I'm not that good at that yet. I'm not. I'm trying. I'm still very much learning that skill. Um, I'm much better this year than I have been in the past. But, like, I've never had to deal with these kinds of problems before in my life. You know, when my income is depending on it, the, the amount of risk involved in everything you're lo I'm looking at here is just really high. Um, and so it's taught me a lot about how to take risks and what to expect from these kinds of crops and stuff like that, you know, um, how to take, how to take risk is a skill. So there's still a tons of value that I've learned that I would have never learned if I didn't go through this problem. You know, all business owners go through these kinds of problems, you know? And so I'm grateful for that experience now. Um, even though it's, you know, last year, I mean, in terms of the bottom line at the end of the year, it's thousands of dollars down the drain, you know? This year, it's not going to be that bad at all. It's going to be fine um, because I've, I'm prepared for it, and I kind of knew my plan was I'm just going to plant whatever plant, extra plants I got lying around. Whenever I pull a plant, I'll just put new plants in the ground, and it'll, it'll pretty much pencil out. And like, I'm not really relying on these as much as I was last year. So I'm a little bit better prepared for it. And, but feeling that pain for a year, literally like, you know, so much money down the drain um the first year or two of this 
has taught me a lot. You know, if, and if I really want to make this a hundred thousand dollar farm this year, um, that's just my plan this year. If I really want to reach those goals, I have to be a lot more careful and a little more strategic with what I'm doing and not just goof around. And, you know, there's nothing I could have done to avoid this problem. You know, this, this is something that was totally out of my control. That's another really big lesson. I have had to let go. I literally, this year when I was pulling plants, yeah, it's, it hurts bad, but I'm l much more detached now. And it's just, I accept it. I've already kind of put it into my plan from day one in this greenhouse. And um, my expectations are much lower. And weirdly enough, the production seems to be much higher. You know, it's weird how that works in life. And so, um, learning, this is one of those examples of learning how to manage your expectations in a way where you can still think clearly and move forward. Because at the end of the day, one of the things I learned last year was, yeah, it was thousands of dollars, but it was only like a couple thousand. And I was so obsessed with tomatoes last year that I didn't grow these kinds of crops as well. And that hurt much worse, actually. I was so distracted by the sexy crops that I didn't do a very good job at all of everything else. And I'm going to go into that in the next segment. Uh, but uh, big lesson here on failure, you know, because this is sort of the Instagram stuff, right? This is like, this is Instagram, this is reality, right? And it's so sexy to talk, to show you a whole row of perfectly growing t tomatoes. It's, and I, I get, you know, excited about it, right? I'm very guilty of the falling into the romance part, but at the end of the day, it's not really the whole picture of this business and life in general. So let's move on to the next segment. So the last problem I'm going to show you is a crop failure. That's not a huge deal to be honest, but it is kind of a illustration of how frustrating the last couple of weeks have been for me. Um, so this is radishes. These are just French breakfast radishes, you know. Um, but if you notice, they are kind of spindly at the top and they're not growing right. And there's the reason for that is it's summer. Summer radishes just don't work very well. And they're also growing really slow. Radishes are supposed to be a 21 day crop. It's been at least 40 days since I planted these and they're still not really ready. You know, we're probably gonna harvest actually fairly decent amount today, but they're not looking very good. They're ugly. Um, and this is kind of normal. If you've ever grown radishes in the summer, most climates they're going to look weird um, they don't like the heat and these were planted when it was really hot so that's why they look so bad the next batch is probably gonna look way better because it was planted when it was colder and also flea beetles are eating them so this is sort of a symptom of the cold weather we've been having um, and it's one of the things that's driving driven me crazy because for me to run my business it i it, i'm actually changing how i do this all the time but like I have any business person or most business people have some sort of cash flow projection that they're doing, figuring out what kind of numbers they need to make every week to make their business work. And I, and especially when you have employees, that's pretty important because payroll is a pretty big expense. And so I've got employees now. And when this kind of stuff happens, it hurts pretty bad because, um, you know, I have a couple thousand dollars in payroll that I need to pay. And, this is part of paying that, you know? So when things are late, it screws up a lot of things with cash flow. And one of the lessons I've learned with this is, you know, this is happening with a lot of stuff in the field. This cauliflower behind me, these broccolis, they're supposed to be 55 days to maturity when you plant a, a plant. It's been 80 since I planted them. I planted them May 29th, it's August 14th. So it's 75 days right now and they're still, I picked some today, but I was supposed to be picking about 80 pounds. We got about 17 and a half pounds, just to give you some perspective what, what the problem is. You know, and at the end of the day, in the, if you zoom out, 
it's not a big deal. You know, I just make it a big deal in my head. Um, and I freak out about it because the big thing is like the veggie box thing. I have 55 people to feed and this was part of the plan. I was supposed to be feeding them like two weeks ago with it and it's still not ready, you know? So I'm waiting, 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 waiting. Um, and then we're running out of season here. So we got 40 days left in the frost free, free growing season here. And I'll have time to plant the second crop there, but it'll probably be radishes or something really fast. So um, luckily I have a lot of crops like that in my arsenal, but this is one of the reasons why Wyoming, the field is just not very valuable because there's just, it grows, everything grows slow here, except for really cold weather crops. And I thought broccoli would do okay. And every year I've tried it, it this happens. It's like a month late, you know? Ooh, it's thundering. That's cool. That must be an omen of some kind. But the, anyway, the, uh, the broccoli and cauliflower, I wasn't really even planning on making much money with it. It's mostly just to feed the veggie box. So it's like not a big deal. Um, everything else in here is doing pretty fine and, and it will produce by the end of the season. That's all that really matters at the end of the day um, because all these problems I'm talking about are really just cash flow. It's not really going to hurt my bottom line at the end of the year. Um, but, you know, it, it's a big one that I've learned to just kind of, okay, I don't need to make all my money right now. It's still all going to produce at some point. I have a cold room where I could store this stuff for a long time to sell it. Um, the real stress is that I'm going to have to, when everything is ready, it's all going to be ready at once. And this is a common problem with our kind of farming in this climate is you plant a couple of successions of some crop and then they grow so slow, they all end up maturing at the same time. And that's troublesome. Um, but I luckily have a cold room, a big refrigerated room that I could store it and it just stores so long in there where it's like a thing like broccoli will be good for almost a month. I bet. Um, I don't even need to worry about it. I have, I'll sell it right away broccoli, but, um, certain things like celery will last almost a month. A lot of this stuff, I'll, I'll have a long time to sell it. So it won't be too big of a deal. If I didn't have that, it would suck more, but, uh, it's a, just another problem, you know, and, and this is just a, a crop failure, you know, it, and I wouldn't even call this a crop failure because this is still going to make some money, but it's not going to make as much as it's supposed to. And, you know, this bed was supposed to yield me 75 bunches and it's probably going to do like 30 um, and 30 at, in like two months instead of 21 days. Um, and it also costs way more to harvest this way because we're supposed to just be picking a whole handful of radishes every time, but we have to thin harvest, you know, pick which ones are ready and that takes way longer. And luckily I have some really great employees that are phenomenal at doing that, which makes it painless. But the point is, you know, these kinds of things happen and, uh, I always think I'm prepared for it and then I'm not, you know, it's just, uh, it's still frustrating when it happens. You know, I made a video a couple weeks ago about four thousand dollars a week in production, and that week we did hit four thousand. Uh, but the last couple, it's been more like three, just because of what I'm talking about. Nothing is producing as fast as I want it to. This week we're probably going to be back up to four, and then after that it'll just keep kind of hovering around four thousand for the rest of the season, um, give or take. Um, but you know, it, it, one of the things that I've learned with this kind of problem too is that it's always a big picture. You always got to zoom out and look at the big picture. Like I, I stress about it that week, but at the end of the day, when you look at the numbers, uh, it's, a, it's going to basically mean nothing, right? This is all going to be a couple numbers on a, on a balance sheet at the end of the year. It's not really like the world is ending. And so these kinds of problems, when you deal with them over and over again, you just kind of get more and more used to it and desensitize and just, I can calmly you know, uh, sail through them or at least do a better job of that. You know, this week I've not been very calm, not going to lie, but, um, and it's really not a big deal. It's just frustrating. It's just like, Oh, I have to not, nah, I have to just think outside the box a lot more than I wanted to, which is, this is a good skill to, to get good at, but it's just kind of a, you know, shit happens. So, um, you just got to deal with it and figure it out. But, you know, these kinds of failures um, help you grow as a person. You know, uh, it's 
I have a hard time relating to a lot of my friends just because they don't have, haven't really gone through these kinds of failures, um, unless they're business owners. And, uh, they, you know, I appreciate what I've earned a lot more, I think, than somebody who just gets paid a salary and works at a desk. You know, I appreciate the meaning of a dollar a lot more because I've, when you have to go through all of this pain to get the dollar, um, and I think I'm going to appreciate that the rest of my life. I hope so. Um, even after this farm is where I want it to be in a couple of years, I want to appreciate that the rest of my life. And I think that's sort of the, uh, the reason I've gone through all of this, I think is to, to sort of share that experience with people and to also appreciate what I have the rest of my life. Cause I will just because I've gone through these kinds of pains. Um, and if I hadn't gone through it, I wouldn't, I would, if I do ever become wealthy, um, I don't think I'd appreciate that money as much, um, just because I've gone through the pain. So just a little perspective on that. Um, and I, I hope this is valuable to somebody. The mainstream school system does not teach this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, as painful as this, these kinds of failures are, they can mold you into a much more wiser, stronger human, um, that can, really handle a lot more um in in life than you would if you don't deal with these problems so i'm very grateful for all this experience now um as i and i'm still going through it right now i'm still being molded i'm still young you know i, I this is only the fourth season for me so i'm still pretty young when it comes to farming and life in general so um but i'm very glad that i'm going through it and i hope uh that this changes your perspective a little bit on failures next time you have one. Um, so anyway, that's it. Hope you enjoyed this one and I will see you in the next one. <clears throat>